those of you who are new with us today, just to kind of give you a bit of a recap, we have been working through a series on Galatians. And so we've actually been through chapter one, two, three, and four in great depth. And um, just a very brief summary. So basically chapters one, two, three, and four are making it very clear to us through a letter that Paul has written to the Galatian church. And honestly, this is one of the most strongly worded letters he's written. He even says things like, you foolish Galatians, who has, has bewitched you? Basically, he is feeling so strong about this word because what has happened is that the Christians have been influenced into adding rituals and, and earthly acts to their salvation in order to gain righteousness. And um, Paul speaks a lot about circumcision, but it's actually not really about circumcision. Circumcision was one of the things that the Judaizers had, had suggested that they need to have, the Christians, in order to be righteous and saved, which was obviously not true because salvation is a free gift from God and there's absolutely nothing that you can do to become righteous. The work is all done by Jesus on the cross. He even says, Paul says in, in Galatians 5 verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So for us, you know, circumcision or not circumcision, it's actually irrelevant. But the principle is the same. Anything that we try to add to the gospel, to the free gift of grace through Jesus Christ, is not the gospel. And so for us, like I said, it's not about circumcision or the things that they used to do, the rituals that they used to perform in those days, but what are the things maybe for us in our day now that we might feel tempted to or want to add to the gospel? And so it might be legalism for you. It might be striving for a heavenly reward through earthly effort. And it may even be spiritual disciplines, which are really good. But if you do them with the wrong intention and not understanding their purpose, and I'm going to expand on that a bit later. So we get this free gift. But then what? Do we sit on the couch watching YouTube because he's done it all? Do we then do what seems right to us? because we've received this free gift of grace and we didn't have to earn it, which is true. So chapters one through four tells us all about what the Christian life is not. It is not about earthly striving. It is not about works. It is not about giving us anything to add to a gospel of grace, which was already done. It was finished. But chapters five and six give us some insight into what the Christian life is. Because the gospel is not stagnant. It is living and active. And it expresses itself through love. Freedom in Christ is not laziness or self-indulgence. Freedom in Christ is a call to love. And this may look like work on your part. It will require action. You know, Roger gives this, this amazing analogy about a Ferrari. He says, it is like receiving the gift of a Ferrari. Now, I don't want a Ferrari, so don't give that to me as a gift. But I think maybe a man would appreciate how incredible this particular gift would be. He says, it's like receiving a Ferrari and then keeping it locked in the garage. You see, if we want access to this incredible gift, we are going to have to learn to drive it. We are going to have to put fuel in it. We will have to service it and take good care of it. And that is going to require some work. Now, work is a very controversial word and I'm going to explain because a works-based gospel is exactly what Paul is preaching against and it's something that we are very against 
because you cannot earn your salvation and no amount of work that you do can make you righteous because Christ has already made you righteous. He's done the work. But once we have received this gift, our response to action comes from a place of love and freedom. It's not about earning God's favor. It is about reflecting who he is, his nature and his character to the world around. You know, we are called to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. And that is going to take some work. Colossians 1 verse 10 says, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. You see, true freedom lies in living a life that glorifies God. And our life can please the Lord and be a blessing to others. When we focus on ourselves, our desires, our needs, do you know that the fruit of that is division and destruction? A spirit-led life displays unity and love, and that is God's nature. That is who he is. And so chapter five gives us some tips and tools on what it looks like to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord and reflects his nature. And in summary, it is very simple. It is to love others. So I've got a scripture, and it's the first one. It's gonna come up on, this, on the slide, hopefully, from Galatians 5, verse 13. So I'm going to read. And those of you who have your Bibles, you can quickly flip there. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. You see, sadly, the grace message has become controversial. And it shouldn't be, because the grace message is a beautiful, beautiful gift. But conveniently, some people have misunderstood it, and they have placed a full stop at the end of chapter four, when in actual fact there is a comma because there is more. Grace was never designed to be a license to indulge the flesh. Because every sinful action will hurt somebody else and that is not love and that does not reflect who God is. You know, if you rob a bank or you commit adultery, God will forgive you but there will be consequences for you on this earth. You will have to go to jail if you rob a bank and you will hurt the ones that you love. And I was just thinking as I was preparing, you know, 
there has been a surge of American pastors actually falling into adultery and, yeah, desires of the flesh. And, you know, they, they will be forgiven and they have been forgiven and they can make amends and, you know, they can work their way towards restoring their marriages. But the damage that has been done, they have taken whole churches down with them. Do you know that it is not possible to hurt people in this way when you are sowing to the Spirit? Because God's love, God's love enables us to live a holy life. His love is not self-centered. His love compels us to serve others. And when we are led by the Spirit, we no longer desire to act in ways that would contradict His word or hurt other people. But our old habits are habits and they want to trip us up. And do you know that you cannot deny these habits without the Holy Spirit? It is impossible. And those of you who have tried will know that this is true. Galatians 5 verse 15, I'm going to just read that again. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And I'm going to emphasize the word walk because walking with the Spirit is an action. It doesn't say lounge on the couch with the Spirit. And walking and action requires movement, direction, and intentionality. It requires aligning our thoughts and our desires with God's will in His Word and through His Spirit. It requires understanding our identity in Him. You cannot do this by willpower or self-discipline. It is not possible, it's unsustainable. And I'm going to take a brief little diversion, but it's on the topic, and I'm going to talk about addictions. And I'm talking about any kind of addictions. It may be alcohol, smoking, pornography, drug addiction, there are so many different addictions. Do you know that you cannot conquer addiction through guilt, shame, condemnation or willpower. And I'm not trying to bring shame and condemnation on any of you now. And where some of these things may lead to some sort of temporary behavioral modification, true and lasting freedom cannot come through those methods. You know, and I I really, please don't hear me when I'm not knocking Alcoholics Anonymous here, but Yeah, because Alcoholics Anonymous, I know that they have helped so many people um, to conquer the addiction to alcohol, but their narrative of once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, and that this is a lifelong condition and disease, it doesn't sit well with me. Sorry. (laughs) It does not sit well with me because it is contrary to God's word. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives in me. When we're born again, we receive the nature of Christ. And that is the truth. Christ is not an addict. He is not an alcoholic. He does not struggle with pornography or any substance abuse. And so when you are born again, his life becomes your life. You are no longer defined by your weaknesses or your past struggles. I also have a problem with the worldly narrative that you can have an addictive personality because when we're born again, we have the mind of Christ. You see, 
addiction at its core thrives on lies. The illusion and false belief that we are weak and incomplete and that we need something external to soothe, reward, or fulfill us. The truth is that you are already complete in Christ. I also want to reject the worldly narrative that addiction is in your DNA. In other words, if one of your parents was an addict, then you literally have no choice. You are not inherently flawed. You are a new creation, and so you have his DNA. And I know some of you might be thinking, oh, well, that's fine for you to say. You know, you, you, know, you don't know the struggles that I've had to walk through. And I, want to, I wasn't going to talk about this because you know I have a problem with water flowing from my eyes. <laughs> but I am the daughter of an alcoholic. <laughs> it's not grandma. <laughs> it's not my mum. <laughs> Thanks for the laugh. My biological father was an alcoholic who ended his life as a tramp on the streets. And when I heard this idea that addiction is in your DNA, as a, as a, a teenager and as, as a child, and even in my adult years, I was wondering what it was that I was going to be addicted to. And I had this absolute revelation that I'm not addicted to anything, not even Christmas decorations. <laughs> My family will dispute that. <clears throat> and I just want to encourage any of you who may be fighting addiction of any sort, you cannot find your freedom in the flesh. Willpower, programs, you will find it in understanding who you are. You see, when you rely on willpower and you fail, it leads to guilt, shame, and condemnation, and that is exactly where the enemy wants you to stay. So reject the lie that you are weak and incomplete because it is a lie. And embrace the truth that in Christ you are whole, empowered, and free. And you do not need any other reward than the gospel because he is your great reward. Okay, so back to Galatians 5. And if we look at verse 23, Two to 23, one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Aren't those beautiful gifts, fruits of the Spirit? And I absolutely love God's analogies because he's given us this analogy of this fruit tree. Now, do you know that we cannot make fruit? You know, the, the, there's an absolute truth that man has made many amazing things. If you look around there, man, man, man can make amazing things in this world, but man has never, ever been able to make anything without using something that God already made. If you think about it, anything that we can make, we make using something that God already made. So the fruit, God makes the fruit. We can't make fruit grow. We don't have that ability. But the best possible way for fruit to grow is planted in good soil and well cultivated. It takes intentional care. And if I think of a farmer um, growing fruit trees, he will maybe prune the fruit trees, plant it in good, them in good soil, and he will look after them. He will take out the weeds and, and just intentionally care for that fruit tree in order for it to be able to produce good fruit. God does the growing and producing of that fruit. 
but we plant ourselves in situations and circumstances that are going to allow for the best possible cultivation of that fruit. And let's just look at the purpose of fruit. What is fruit actually for? It's actually not for the fruit tree, it's not for us. It's for others. The fruit tree produces fruit for others to enjoy because love is not love unless it is shared. If a fruit tree grows in isolation, there's no purpose to that fruit tree. And spiritual growth and fruitfulness happens relationally. I'm gonna just make a few hops across to Galatians 6, and one of them is Galatians 6 verse 78. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. We get to sow, and we get to sow into the spirit. So what does that actually look like? And I'm going to talk now about spiritual disciplines, and like I said earlier, if you do them to gain righteousness, you have missed the point of all of these things because you can't gain righteousness. It has already been given to you as a free gift. So we don't do them out of legalism or striving. We do them to, to be reminded who we are and to sow to the Spirit, to cultivate our fruit. So the first one I'm going to talk about is reading the Bible. You know, the Word and the Spirit are connected. They never contradict each other. The Word is Spirit, the Spirit is Word. And the Word of God is God's truth and reminds us who we are in Him. It reminds us of our identity so that we can resist the, the temptations that are going to come to us in the world. And you know, the world is going to lie to us constantly. We will hear lies every single day about who we are. And a daily dose of, of the truth is exactly what we need to combat those lies. And at this point, I also just want to make a little side note about what reading the Bible is not meant to be. It is not to be used in arguments or quarrels or to tear other Christians down. It is not a weapon to be used against the Christian family. If we do this, we are doing the devil's work. How sad that the body and bride of Christ receive their greatest attacks from within the family. You know, one would think it comes from outside in the world where the enemy is, but in actual fact, our greatest wounds come from the ones closest to us. And Roger and I, as, as leaders, can honestly attest to that, that actually some of our greatest hurts and wounds have come from within the body of Christ. You know, I read somewhere um, that the Christian army is the only army that attacks its own troop, troops and shoots its wounded. Roger says he thinks that's not true, but I did read it somewhere, so it must be true. I'm sure there are other um, organizations that also attack their own, but how sad that as Christians, we do that to one another. So when we read the Bible, it's not to gain some ammunition to hurt someone else, it's to actually gain some understanding of our identity and who we were created to be. You know, I, I have, I've, there, there's been some research on what reading the Bible four times a week does for you, and I have shared this before, but I'm just going to recap. So, people that read the Bible four times a week, these are the stats. Loneliness drops by 30%. Anger issues drop by 32%. Bitterness in relationships drops by 40%. Alcoholism drops by 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops by 60%. Viewing pornography drops by 61%. Sharing our faith increases by 200%. And discipling others increases by 230%. You see, the beauty about reading the Bible is that it's threefold. One, it helps us 
to understand our identity and who we were created to be. It also helps us to have fruitful relationships with those around us. And it equips us for the mission that Jesus gave us. You know, when Jesus uh, ascended back to heaven after he, he died and was crucified, he left behind this mission for us, the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. And we can't do that if we're not equipped with the word and the truth. So the first spiritual discipline is reading the Bible. The second is prayer. Prayer is how we connect with God. And I wanna use the analogy of Roger and my marriage. So our marriage is a given. You can't take that away from us. It is done, we're in covenant with each other. But we are so intentional about going on date nights and having quality time together. And those that know us know that we have these conversations, starter cards. I'm always on connection. Um, and we are working towards having a good relationship and connecting with each other. And prayer is the same thing. It's actually connecting with and spending time with God so that we can know him better and have a better relationship with him. Worship is the third spiritual discipline. It is just the most beautiful thing to be in worship with, with our brothers and sisters, with the bride of Christ, and, and actually just have this fresh revelation of who we are and what we were created to do. What a gift. The fourth spiritual discipline is tithing and, and generosity and giving. And Selwyn, is that you up there? So on Thursday, Wednesday nights for the last three weeks, we've had um, a discipleship training time on finances. And on Wednesday, Selwyn shared so beautifully on the difference between tithing and giving from a place of law and from a place of love. And so when you just nailed it, you really just absolutely nailed it. And if you, if you haven't heard it, I really encourage you to go onto the YouTube channel and listen. It was really, really helpful. Because law instructs us to give, but love compels us to give. Because that is the nature of Christ. And when we reflect his nature, his nature is to give. We don't have to, we get to. Another spiritual discipline is baptism. And I love that we are doing baptisms today. We don't have to to become righteous. Um, we are already righteous at the point of salvation. But what a beautiful act as a command from the Father to be baptized as an external demonstration to the world of an internal reality that has taken place. But what I also love about baptism is how it encourages the body of Christ. I'd, for those of you who have been to a baptism and, and, and watched, it is just the most beautiful, inspiring and encouraging space to see people just radically want to, to demonstrate to the world, I have received Jesus, I want the world to know about it. It's just so beautiful. Another spiritual discipline is service because service reflects the nature of God. 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and so we get to lay down our lives for others. Service is, an evidence, is evidence of the Spirit of God inside of us. There are many other spiritual disciplines, but the last one I'm going to speak about is fellowship. You all being here, I'm speaking to the choir, but... You can't love others while you are on your couch watching YouTube. And this is why church is not optional. We love one another when we are together. Show up, be here. Galatians 9 verse 10 says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people but wait for it, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So, you know, as, as much as there's so many good things that we can do out there, there are so many amazing charitable works and things that we can do out there in the world. And I often hear people say, I do good things. I, I give food to the people at, at the robot. That's amazing. That's great. But this line tells us that our good works are especially for those 
and our church family. And loving others is how we sow into the spirit, and it is also the surest sign that we are walking in the spirit. But loving others does not mean that we have to be a doormat. And I'm going to once again jump across to Galatians 6 verse one, and if you don't mind putting up my second slide. There's just something very interesting here that's really helpful in the context of of church community. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you will also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. So it's an interesting little paradox that may appear to be contradictory. And in some versions, and I love the NIV version, but some versions actually say, carry each other's burdens, and then later on they say, carry your own burdens. But it's, it's really helpful in, in reflecting this balance between Christian community and personal responsibility. And it's helpful to know that the, the Greek word for burden is baros, and it means a crushing weight. And the word for load is like a backpack. So the burden, the crushing weight, is maybe a temporary crisis that people are going through, and then we will Obviously, as a church community, we will be all over that thing, and there are people that are sitting here right now that know exactly what it means to be in that crushing weight, where you literally cannot do this on your own. But your load are your daily tasks, your daily responsibilities. And our aim is to empower people and not to create a dependency on us. Because our goal is to lead people to Jesus. If we are the solution to people's problems, then we are setting ourselves up for codependency, disappointment, and burnout, and that's on both sides. And in this scenario, you will never be able to do enough. We should never be working harder on other people's problems than they are. We cannot save or change others, but we can introduce them to the one who can. It's quite a revelation and quite freeing to know that as Christians we are allowed to have boundaries. So all of these spiritual disciplines that are said are ways that we get to sow into the spirit. None of them are going to affect your salvation but they will help you to cultivate the seed that was planted in you at salvation. So I'm gonna encourage you to examine your life. And band, I'm gonna ask you if you don't mind coming up again, and I would really love us to worship to that song, I think it was the second one, By the Blood, I think it was called. It was just perfect for this. Examine your life. Are you sowing to the spirit? or to the flesh? Are you walking with the spirit? Or are you a couch critic that is tearing others down and wounding the bride of Christ? Salvation is by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone because it produces action, it produces joy, and it produces love. Galatians 9, 6 verse 9 to 10 says, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Friends, I really want to encourage you not to give up. Sow into the spirit. Spiritual growth and sowing takes time. 
You know, when we water that seed and we go there the next morning and we look to see if there's been growth, it's, it can be discouraging sometimes when we don't see the growth. But Jesus is busy growing. Stay faithful. And I'm gonna ask you to stand because I feel like today, I feel like God wants to do some serious business with people. And I feel that there may be people in the room who actually have not received that free gift of grace. Maybe you actually do not know what it feels like to receive the nature and mind of Christ. And I want to encourage you, we're gonna have some people up here that are, 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 are available to pray for you if you would like to receive that free gift of grace for the first time. And then I feel like as we go into the song, I feel like God is wanting to highlight some things for people and I, I'm not wanting to embarrass anybody, but I feel like God is wanting to, to break off striving from people. Yeah. Like if you've been striving for a heavenly reward by earthly means, I feel like God wants to break that from you. I feel like he wants to set you free today and I also feel in the room that there are some people that maybe have struggled with addiction. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I feel like there are many people in the room that have been trying with all their might, they've been white knuckling it to find freedom from addiction. I feel like today, Jesus wants to set you free. And he wants to do it by reminding you that you are not weak. You are not incomplete. You are his. You've been created perfect in him. He is your great reward. There's freedom for you today and it doesn't look like trying, it doesn't look like striving, it looks like surrender. And so as we sing this song, if you feel like you need prayer, I'm gonna ask you to come up to this side and those people that are being baptized can go and get changed into their cozies. And I really wanna encourage you to stick around for the baptism because what a beautiful thing to watch somebody demonstrate to the world that they've chosen to have the mind and life of Christ and to sow into the Spirit. So as we sing the song, because I feel like this song, the words are just so beautiful and so profound and so freeing. So receive that gift of grace, that beautiful gift of grace. God's grace compels you to love. And you can only love because He first loved you. Come and receive Him.